Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, featuring your host, Anna Jaworski. Our program is designed to empower the CHD or congenital heart defect community. Our program may also help families who have children who are chronically ill by bringing information and encouragement to you in order to become an advocate for your community. Now, here is Anna Jaworski. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna. I am Anna Jaworski and the host of Heart to Heart with Anna. We are in Season 9 and our theme this season is Advancements in Congenital Heart Disease. Our show today is Advancements in Understanding the Psychology of Living with a Congenital Heart Defect and our guest is Dr. Adrian Kovacs. Adrian Kovacs earned a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Memphis with a focus in behavioral medicine. She began working with adults with congenital heart disease as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Florida. From 2004 to 2015, she was a psychologist with the Toronto Congenital Cardiac Center for Adults at the Peter Monk Cardiac Center University Health Network in Toronto, Canada. She also held a faculty appointment in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto and was an adjunct scientist with the Toronto Sick Kids Hospital Research Institute. In January 2016, she moved to Portland, Oregon to join the Knight Cardiovascular Institute at Oregon Health and Science University to establish and be the director of the Behavioral Cardiovascular Program. She divides her time between clinical work and research, and congenital cardiology remains her primary focus. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Dr. Kovacs. Thanks so much, Anna. I've listened to some of your other shows, and it really is an honor to be speaking with you today. I think you provide such a valuable service to the congenital heart disease community. Oh, well, thank you so much for saying that. Well, I'm so happy that you had a chance to listen to some of the shows, and it was fun talking with you before we actually came on <laughs> air to find out that Agreed. we both know Tracy Lebecki, and she's one of my <laughs> favorites. So it's always fun to see the people that we have in common. Exactly. I am so excited about today's topic because this is something I'm afraid we really don't talk enough about, and I really want us to put a spotlight on this topic. So it seems like 20 or 30 years ago, there wasn't even much consideration at all given to the psychology of living with a chronic illness. And also 20 to 30 years ago, to be quite honest with you, not many children survived to adulthood. So can you tell us what it was like for children and adult survivors with congenital heart defects 20 or 30 years ago? Sure. I think that in the mid to late 1900s, the main focus for surgeons and cardiologists was reducing mortality and morbidity. So Mm -hmm. I guess stated very simply, I think the main goal was to improve survival of infants born with congenital heart disease, and they definitely succeeded with that regard. So I've heard people call this one of the big success stories of modern medicine, and now as a result in North America, there are actually more adults than children living with congenital heart disease. Yeah, isn't that amazing? It's phenomenal, actually. So going back to your question, 20 to 30 years ago, there likely wasn't as much discussion about the psychological impact of living with congenital heart disease as there is today. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. So I think it's actually nice that we get to turn our attention to the to the broader impact. And as survival rates have improved, so has that focus on what we call the biopsychosocial impact of living with chronic illnesses like congenital heart disease. And that term biopsychosocial goes back to the late 1970s and really describes that relationship between phys- physical functioning, emotional well-being, and social well-being. Uh, The really interesting thing, though, is uh, in preparing for this show, I looked back and there are actually papers dating back to the late 1950s that do talk about the psychological aspects of congenital heart disease. Wow. Although I admit, I yeah, I I wasn't so familiar with those, and I haven't read them because they're tricky to access, but I thought what this tells us is even going back decades, there were people who recognized this. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. That's good that people did recognize that this was something we needed to think about. I agree. I agree. I think those people were very forward thinking. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't really until I'd say the 1990s and early 2000s that there emerged increasing research investigating that psychosocial impact of living with congenital heart disease, both in childhood and adulthood. And now, as we know from research and as well as our own clinical experiences, living with congenital heart disease often affects more than a person's heart. And I think that's why you're focused on it for this show. So we know that living with congenital heart disease can affect a person's psychological and social well-being, 
-hmm. school and career choices, family planning, and overall quality of life. Right. And so in North America, we estimate that about one-third of adults with congenital heart disease will have clinically significant difficulties with depression or anxiety. And we've learned that from research where we conduct clinical interviews. And the interesting thing is not all of these difficulties with mood and anxiety are revealed during routine clinical appointments. So there was one study that actually investigated psychological well-being in patients who were identified as being well-adjusted, and still about a third of those had significant difficulties. So I think it's important to start having this dialogue. And mm -hmm. we also know that it's important to engage patients and understand what they want and need. So we might think, well, they're at elevated risk of mood and anxiety difficulties, but is this something they're interested in addressing? Mm -hmm. And so along with colleagues, I actually conducted research looking at patient interest in psychological services. And in one study, we surveyed over 150 patients and learned that actually half were interested in at least one area of psychological treatment, most commonly coping with a cardiac condition or stress management. And in a separate study, we conducted focus groups and patients told us that they were interested in psychoeducation. And by that, we mean what are the typical reactions to living with congenital heart disease? Mm -hmm. They really wanted opportunities to interact with other adults with congenital heart disease, as well as individual or group counseling. So I'd say that Nowadays, compared to a few decades ago, providers and patients all recognize the importance of understanding and addressing psychological challenges. Oh, I just love that answer because I think there has been a lot of growth on the part of the patients themselves as well. I think patients yes. nowadays are much better consumers and they understand the processes involved better, don't you? I couldn't agree more. I think that when I think of psychology in heart disease, any kind of cardiovascular disease, I think we're a few decades behind oncology. And the most mm -hmm. large cancer programs automatically include psychosocial oncology, so mental health professionals. And I think cardiology historically has been a little far behind. And I think nowadays we're seeing that patients and families are beginning to advocate for resources also. Yeah, I so love it's that. Been, I, I think it's been a really strong patient movement. And I guess, mm -hmm. I guess the other thing I'd want to say is, Although we're talking about this, I don't want to come across as all gloom and doom. So we know that adults with congenital heart disease are at elevated risk of mood and anxiety disorders. However, I'd also want to emphasize that as a group, their resilience inspires me every day. So from birth, they face a unique set of challenges. And when I meet somebody with congenital heart disease for the first time, I always ask what helps them cope with these unique challenges and patients regularly inspire me in their ability to focus on what is most important in life. Mm -hmm. And they yeah. often are seeking psychological services to really have the best quality of life possible. Right, right. I think that one of the things that has inspired me in working with this population, because I do not have a heart defect myself, but I'm the mother of an adult now who has a congenital heart defect. But one of the things that has inspired me is how optimistic and how they just make every day count. And I wonder in some ways if being born with a congenital heart defect or having a child with a congenital heart defect might not improve your quality of life just because you do realize how precious each and every day is. Right, and it's actually really interesting that you say that because there's research now looking at quality of life. And when we look at some things like physical functioning or physical status, often adults with defects of moderate or great complexity struggle a little more physically, but it's quite common to see them report a good overall quality of life or what's been described as life satisfaction. And in fact, there was a study done of several thousand adults with congenital heart disease around the world, so in 15 countries. And what we found actually is that overall quality of life reports are quite good. And I think what that means is that patients and families learn to focus not only on health aspects, but they have a broader conceptualization of quality of life. So it might be they learn the importance of spending time with family or friends or mm -hmm. 
seeking activities and interests that really bring them life satisfaction. So it's not uncommon for me to talk to somebody and they say, I decide what I want to do and I know that I may have a shortened life expectancy, so I'm determined to make the most right. of my life. And yeah. so they start living really rich and full lives younger. And yeah. and I think that's one of the, selfishly, one of the benefits I have in my job is that, you know, every time I'm speaking with people, I get reminded of what's truly important in life. Oh, I just love that. That is a perfect way for us to take a quick <laughs> commercial break. Oh, this is wonderful. Coming up next, we're going to talk to Dr. Kovacs about post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, and survivor's guilt. The most common theme that I hear is why. She always needed um, a lot of attention. She had strokes. Even though it's a natural inclination to withdraw from the CHD community, I think being a part of it helped me be part of the solution. Heart to Heart with Michael. Please join us every Thursday at noon Eastern. I'm Michael Lieben, and I'll be your host as we talk with people from around the world who have experienced those most difficult moments. Home Tonight Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective. I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home Tonight Forever. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. That's Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. We are in Season 9, and the theme this season is Advancements in Congenital Heart Disease. Our show today is Advancements in Understanding the Psychology of Living with a Congenital Heart Defect, and our guest is Dr. Adrian Kovacs. Dr. Kovacs, post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, is finally being recognized in the CHD community. Can you tell us why someone in the CHD community might suffer from PTSD and what help is available for them? Sure. And just as an introduction for those listeners who might not be sure what we mean by post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. It refers to a cluster of symptoms that develop in response to a traumatic stressor. If we think of some congenital heart disease-specific examples, this list could potentially include traumatic events related to previous surgeries, diagnostic tests, or shocks for patients with implantable cardioverter defibrillators. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to note, however, that exposure to these events, like surgery, does not mean that a person will develop PTSD. In fact, most don't. So to be diagnosed formally with PTSD, the event will have had to lead to things like re-experiencing the traumatic event, often through nightmares or flashbacks, avoiding situations or thoughts that might remind a person of the event, having significantly negative thoughts and changes in arousal or reactivity, such as difficulties with sleep or concentration or being more easily startled. Okay. So I'd like to emphasize that a person with congenital heart disease can have significant anxiety related to a previous health experience, but that doesn't mean that they'll meet full diagnostic criteria, and yet at the same time, I think they would potentially still benefit from mental health services. Okay. So we can talk about formal PTSD, as well as health-related anxiety. But if we talk about PTSD, just last year, a team of researchers from Philadelphia published a study investigating PTSD in a sample of over 100 adults with congenital heart disease. And in the spirit of full disclosure, I did have the privilege of being part of this research team. Okay. And they found that 11% reported elevated symptoms of PTSD related specifically to an event associated with a congenital heart disease or treatment. But then about double that, 21% met criteria for overall PTSD symptoms. 
And that means that our patients can experience trauma that might be related or unrelated to congenital heart disease. Hmm. And these rates are higher than those observed in the general population. So we know that we can say that our adult with congenital heart disease do seem at greater risk of PTSD. Right. And in addition, from this study, we learned that symptoms of PTSD were also associated with symptoms of depression. Oh. So clearly there is a need to identify and treat PTSD in our adults with congenital heart disease. Doesn't that just make sense given the severity of what they're facing? I mean, let's face it, a lot of our adults and the parents and grandparents and everybody associated with that disease process, they're facing mortality. And that's a scary thing to have to face. I agree. I think that we can talk about health-related anxiety and whether it's PTSD due to past events or anxiety regarding upcoming health challenges. I think it all warrants attention and acknowledgement from health professionals also. So which I guess brings me to the second part of your question, what help is available mm -hmm. to these individuals facing PTSD or significant anxiety? And I guess the answer is that it really varies center by center or program by program. And so there are a few adult congenital heart disease programs like mine that have decided to integrate psychological services within the program. Others have linked with psychologists, psychiatrists, clinical social workers or counselors within their hospital or community. However, this is an emerging area. And so I think that it's care is certainly not developed where we'd like it to be. Okay. Well, and I think that it's because it's emerging. Like you said, we're finally really starting to recognize the need. Yes. And what I loved about having Dr. Warnofsky on the program a couple weeks ago was that he talked about creating a roadmap for success. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the roadmap is to have the psychological team as part of the team. Right now, it seems mm -hmm. like, or for the last 20 years anyway, it seems like most of the team was focused on the cardiothoracic surgeon, the pediatric cardiologist, the pediatrician. And then as people aged, some of them were lost to follow-up care. Well, now we're seeing the importance of maintaining that care, that this is a chronic condition, but it doesn't seem like we've pulled in more team members. And I think what Dr. Warnofsky is suggesting is let's establish a good team at the very beginning of integrated professionals, and certainly a psychosocial team would be part of that roadmap. Mm -hmm. I think that when I listened to his show and I thought he did a great job of outlining the plan. I think that where we are now is we're trying to move from the guidelines and recommendations to the implementation. Right. So I think that anxiety, more broadly, I guess the psychological impact of living with congenital heart disease is on the radar of both patients and healthcare teams. So mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier that patients themselves have identified psychosocial care as a priority and are starting to advocate for their needs. In addition, there are patient advocacy organizations like the Adult Congenital Heart Association, right. and they provide online education, have peer support programs, and host national conferences, mm -hmm. and all of which include a focus on neurocognitive and psychological needs of adults with congenital heart disease. And although we certainly aren't at a place yet where all patients with congenital heart disease have access to psychological services, I'm hopeful that the situation will improve at national and international conferences, for example, focused on pediatric cardiology. There are now routinely sessions focused on the psychosocial needs of patients and families. Yes. In fact, I would actually say this is quite a hot topic yeah. and a priority for the American College of Cardiology. And here's another example I can think of. The Congenital Heart Public Health Consortium was formed a few years ago by a number of organizations, including American Academy of Pediatrics, American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, the CDC. And a major focus of this consortium is lifelong care, and there's a specific committee focused on cardiac, neurodevelopmental, and psychosocial quality of life. So I think we are all hoping for a change. The challenge is to figure out how to implement this in the healthcare setting. All right. I think it's a difficult thing to implement because you're talking about so many different people being involved in a team. And that's going to increase the cost, of course. And so then you have insurance issues. So I'm wondering, here in the United States, it's a big deal because we don't have consistent 
insurance and health care, mm-hmm. state to state, even hospital to hospital in the same city, you can see variances. Yeah. Have there been studies done that you know of in other countries where they have socialized medicine where this isn't the same issue? Well, we can look at Canada and the U.S., for example, but I think our rates are the psychological concerns of adults with congenital heart disease are actually quite similar. The interesting thing is if we look at the Netherlands, for example, and Elizabeth Utens is a psychologist there who's done quite a bit of research, and we've chatted about this, and they find lower rates of psychological distress, so lower rates of mood and anxiety disorders than we do in North America. So there does seem to be some international variation, I think, and I don't know whether it's a cultural thing or an access to care matter. Mm -hmm. I do think that it is challenging for people to access specialized psychology or mental health care as well. So sometimes people will have insurance coverage that will provide access to mental health services, but those people may not have any experience working with people with congenital heart disease or even cardiovascular disease in general. So it can be tricky sometimes within the community to find somebody with health psychology experience. Well, don't you think too, though, if you're comparing Canada and North America as a whole to, say, the Netherlands, Mm -hmm. geographically, it's a much smaller place. And so I think the concentration of care is very different than when you're looking at Canada, where things are spread really far apart. And you can have somebody who lives in a major city, such as Toronto, and the care that they receive is going to be totally different than somebody who lives way out in a country where Toronto is a two-hour car ride for them. Oh, exactly. And we had patients that lived so far away, they had to fly in for their annual appointments. Or if it was a drive, it might be 10 years. It's a very spread out and large geographic reason. So it's, it's about having access to mental health care. And then it's about mental health professionals being in your community. So a lot of people who live in smaller towns and more rural areas just don't have access to anybody right. there. Right. So I think and that's why I do think that programs like the Adult Congenital Heart Association has a peer support program. And I think that a lot of people are turning online for some of that support nowadays. I think they are too. And I think it's terrific that we have that available. And there's that recognition. I also think it's great that we're talking about this, Dr. Kovacs, Mm -hmm. because it reduces Mm -hmm. some of the stigma attached to it. I know there are some people who don't want to even acknowledge that they have a problem because they don't want to appear weak. They don't want to appear that they're not quote unquote coping or handling it. And that's not what it's about. And I think the more we talk about it, the more people Mm -hmm. will see it's okay to feel frightened. It's okay not to like needles. (laughs) Some of the Mm -hmm. anxiety invoking situations that our patients are having to go through, it's normal. I would think it would almost be strange if you weren't anxious about some of those things. That's exactly, you could be a psychologist because that's, that's exactly, you know, I do, I do a lot of, we call it normalizing. So, you know, when people come in and they describe some of these health challenges they faced in the past or have in front of them and they talk about feeling down and depressed, or scared or anxious, I let them know that it's completely understandable. And in fact, mm-hmm. that I'd be surprised if they weren't having any kind of emotional reaction. Right. And so I think that reassurance goes a long way. I do think that that's why whenever possible, having a mental health professional integrated within the team can be so helpful because mm-hmm. one of the things that I talk about with patients is I say, I'm here because your cardiology team understands that living with a heart condition affects more than your heart. And I think there's something destigmatizing about a cardiologist or a nurse practitioner who can say, why don't I refer you to Dr. Kovacs? We have somebody part of our team because we think this is really important. can often be more reassuring than saying, we need to refer you externally or we, we right. think you ought to talk to your family doctor about an external yes. referral. So being part of a team, I think, sends a message that we understand that there are challenges. You can be an average person dealing with really atypical situations, and we think those deserve some extra attention. Oh, I just absolutely love this. This is great. Don't leave yet, folks. We have to take another quick commercial break. When I saw so many of these CHG groups growing, I found family just ready to join me. Anyone who is a member of the adult congenital heart defect community can be a guest on our show. 
We have a great year planned, and we look forward to sharing other interesting topics. Heart to Heart with Nicole and David, serving the ACHD community, Wednesdays at noon Eastern. Did you know that most men suffer from beard itch, ingrown hairs, and a dry face, all because they're not using the right shaving tools? At woodraiser.com, we sell handmade heirloom quality badger hair brushes that exfoliate the skin, open the pores, and stimulate hair follicles, which gives the gentleman a closer, more comfortable shave and a clean face. Visit our website, woodraiser.com, where you can learn more about men's skin care and check out our professional shaving tools. A perfect gift for your man, built to last for generations. That's W O O D R A Z O R dot com. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Our show today is Advancements in Understanding the Psychology of Living with a Congenital Heart Defect, and our guest is Dr. Adrian Kovacs. I have so enjoyed talking with you about this topic, Dr. Kovacs, and in the second segment, I really wanted to get to survivor's guilt as well, but I'm so glad we had a chance to talk as much as we did about anxiety and depression. I just think those topics are not talked about enough. But I do want to just briefly talk about survivor's guilt because it seems like the more adult survivors I'm meeting, especially the older adult survivors, the more I'm hearing about them experiencing great sadness because now they have finally, as adults, most of them were adults before they reached out and found another adult survivor who had a heart defect like they did, and now they're losing them. And the guilt that is associated with them surviving after their new friends have passed away, or even longtime friends have passed away. So can you tell us what kind of help is available for those people? Sure. I'm glad you asked that question because I think it's an original question and something that we don't often talk about at the professional conferences. And yet I've spoken with a lot of adults with congenital heart disease who have formed really strong connections with other patients. They may be hospitalized at the same time. They mm-hmm. may be waiting for transplant, for example, at the same time. They may right. be recovering from surgery. And they've been really understandably upset at another person's death. And I go back to that because it's not surprising that we would feel upset upon the death of somebody who we were close to. Sure. I've also spoken with another example is healthy siblings who express anxiety and guilt because they're healthy while their sibling is not. Yes. So that's just another example of, I would say, that survivor's guilt. I actually think that survivor's guilt and a sense of grief and distress upon the death of another person with congenital heart disease might be more common in the current age of social media. So things are different again than they were 20 years ago because now people have that ability to form really strong bonds with people with congenital heart disease, not only at their own town or city or program, Mm -hmm. but also around the country. Sure. And they're developing these connections with people that they may never meet in person and details of their lives and also their deaths are shared almost in real time. So I, yes. I think it's something that we ought to be very mindful of mm-hmm. moving forward is how to anticipate this. And I think when faced with this, I think we can be sad and upset. And it can also lead people to question their own mortality sure. and their own longer term health expectations. So mm-hmm. I would use this as a cue to have those discussions with your health care providers for people who have questions about their own longer-term health expectations. And we actually know from research that this is something that, again, most patients are seeking to have these conversations with health care providers. Well, I think that's a good conversation to have. But my question would be, do you think that most health care providers, meaning cardiologists, Mm -hmm. would recognize that maybe this is something that they would need to see a counselor for? I think that we're starting to become more aware of this. I think we've done some research looking at this, and we know that this is a priority for patients themselves, and it's an emerging priority for healthcare professionals. So again, it's one of these things that is on the radar, and we're coming up with stronger guidelines and recommendations, and it's the implementation that is a little far behind, as it often is. I think that this is one of the areas where we recognize that we can do better. So I think that right. whole concept of psychosocial well-being, family impact, advanced care planning, all of these things, I think we realize we can do better. Mm-hmm. And I really think that this is the next 
frontier of improvements in congenital heart disease care. So it's not that surgeons and cardiologists and researchers are not going to be trying to figure other ways to improve mortality and morbidity, but I think the largest gains moving forward really will be in the psychosocial well-being and quality of life. Oh, I love that. I agree with you 100%. -hmm. I think so, too, because we have (laughs) finally moved from just having the people survive. That was such a huge hurdle to get over. And now that we are over that, it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Survival is number one. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we certainly want to help people live longer and have fewer cardiac symptoms. But at the same time, this is, I think, our next opportunity to do well by these patients. So as a broad field of providers, taking care of people with congenital heart disease, I think our collective responsibility goes beyond saving and extending their lives. And I think we ought to help people live as rich and full lives as possible. Inside the heart world and outside. In an ideal world, isn't this something that we would be talking to everybody about? Yes, uh, yes. <laughs> I, I like that plan, Anna. <laughs> well, I think that having my son, Alexander, did heighten my awareness of how important every day was. And I'm lucky. He's 22. He has come back home to live, and I'm thrilled about it. Mm -hmm. And we're experiencing wonderful things together and as a family. And we do things differently than what my parents did with me. And I think part of that is because he has had this chronic condition. We don't let opportunities pass without trying to seize the day. And I did a whole season Mm -hmm. on seizing the day. And I've seen this as a common theme with a lot of survivors is that they Mm -hmm. recognize how important every day is. Of course, we're sharing that with our heart healthy son too. And I think this would be, it would behoove the entire world to just realize how important every day is and that the quality of life that you have is not dependent necessarily on the job you have, but on how much satisfaction you have in every day that you live. Oh, I couldn't agree more. That's very well said. Well, thank you. I've had a lot of time to think about it. (laughs) (laughs) 22 years, right? (laughs) Yes, 22 years. And you know what? It just gets better and better. And part of it, I'm sure, is the fact that I am doing this podcast. I am in touch with a lot of people. I find the congenital heart defect community to be a very optimistic one. Not that we don't suffer from grief. I mean, We all mourn when we lose somebody. And you're right. Social media has changed the face of congenital heart defects. 22 years ago, the Internet was in its infancy. We had listservs where we wrote notes back and forth to each other. Today, people are sharing videos. We see photographs. And you're right, in real time. Mm -hmm. It's totally different. It makes your relationship with people much more intense. Mm -hmm. And so when you grieve, to me... I feel that it's a very intense grieving, maybe not more so because when I was dealing with an infant and I was talking with a lot of parents who also had infants and young children and we lost them, it was devastating. And part of the devastation was that we were so far apart, we regretted the fact that we weren't able to be closer. Mm -hmm. So every situation has its pluses and minuses. But I do agree with you that the psychosocial aspect of living with a congenital heart defect is the new frontier. And I'm excited to see that the professionals are paying heed to this. You told me during a commercial break how special your hospital is for what it is they do. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? And can you tell us if you see this as a trend in other big hospitals across the United States and maybe across the world? Well, I like to think we're beginning a trend. I was recruited here with the opportunity to build a behavioral cardiovascular program. So to build a program that would grow to meet the needs of all cardiovascular patients, whether they had congenital heart disease or acquired heart disease, although my personal focus remains congenital, Mm -hmm. congenital cardiology. And I think that one of the real keys will be having leadership that recognizes, again, that having a heart condition doesn't only affect a person's heart, it can affect them in a lot of different ways and are willing to invest some resources Mm -hmm. targeting those needs. And I think it's a nice match between patient needs and patient expectations and patient Mm -hmm. advocacy, as well as having this be a designated priority for a program's leadership. And the interesting thing is innovation is really a key word in academic medical centers. And Oftentimes, they talk about innovation in diagnostic imaging or interventions and things like that. And I think 
isn't this an innovative way that we can do better by our patients? So what about if we actually took care of the whole person? We provided comprehensive care that might include mental health care, so psychology, social work, counseling, psychiatry, for example, Mm -hmm. may target family planning properly in a more comprehensive approach, may target cardiac rehabilitation, for example. Mm -hmm. So what if we actually were really innovative by providing comprehensive care and other than having personnel, it's not such a costly intervention. So I'm not looking to buy a machine that costs several hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is something that we provide just by having that personal connection to our patients. So I think that we're trying to build something that we hope can be replicated by other centers. And I think Mm -hmm. One of the unique things is we're looking at research, but also really providing that clinical care. We hope that other programs will continue to implement this model. And I have been seeing other programs around the country expand their focus. So we really hope it's something that will continue to build everywhere. Well, I love it. That's a perfect note for us to end on. This has gone by way too fast. Thank you so much for coming on the program today. Oh, thank you, Anna. Oh, I have just loved Thank you it. very much. Well, I hope you'll come back because you clearly have a lot that you can share with us. And I told you during the break, I'm planning on devoting a whole season just to the biopsychosocial development and needs of the congenital heart defect community. So I hope I can count on you to come back. I'd love to return. Thank you, Anna. Well, thank you. And that does conclude this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. Thanks for listening today. Please find and follow us on iTunes. And remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you have been inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart defect community. Heart to Heart with Anna, with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern Time.